both the power, authority, and leadership. So because by the day, we really want to be someone who helps to make a progress, not to hamper or to harm. Talking about the aspiration, you really need to articulate that well and really give them, give people or your stakeholders around a sense of hope. Yes, that this is a goal that we can manage to achieve. It's not so much a, you know, a dream land or this is too fluffy to get. It's really something that we are able to reach. Hello, you're listening to the Leaders of Learning podcast the podcast that explores learning in the 21st century with educators, leaders, and entrepreneurs from around the world. I'm your host, Ling Ling. I'm also the founder and director of Spark Learning Solutions. We help to build thriving organizational cultures and create effective intercultural collaboration through education, coaching, and consulting. are everywhere. They can be your manager, your company CEO, your sports team leader, your parents, and even yourself. But describing what leadership is can be complex. Many management and leadership gurus offer models and framework to help describe and develop our leaders. However, much of these leadership models are based on the behaviors and styles of leaders from the Western world. In Asia, leaders behave differently. Depending on where you come from, leadership styles can be vastly diverse, contrasting, and even counterintuitive. What makes Asian leaders unique? How do we become leaders in Asia? And how can we nurture our emerging leaders in Asia? Joining us is the co-founder and president of the Center of Asia Leadership, Samuel Kim. He is passionate about nurturing and empowering talents and to help emerging leaders to be socially responsible as they face today's complex challenges. Prior to the Center of Asia Leadership, or CALI for short, Samuel worked for 14 years in a wide range of sectors, from strategy consulting and social entrepreneurship to international development, politics and government. He has worked for and with over 30 renowned organizations, including the United Nations, UNESCO, Samsung, and Toyota. Hello, Samuel. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Ling Ling, for, for inviting me to this uh, talk. I, I really look for, I'm looking forward to uh, having a very wonderful uh, discussion with you. So am I. I'm glad to have you on the show and spending some time with us today to talk about Asia leadership. Mm-hmm. So I know the Center for Asia Leadership Initiative, or CALI for short, is a group of nonprofit international organizations that was established in 2014. Can you tell us a little bit more about CALI and how it came about? Yes, uh, this goes back uh, to 2014. I uh, was a student at Harvard uh, Kennedy School of Government at the time. And to start, I have never, you know, had an experience of running a, uh, what we call the social profit or education or, or, or anything that has to do with leadership. Uh, so it was a new area for me. Uh, but how this came about was my time in Korea in, back in 2012, uh, when I had about 36 of, of my friends from Harvard uh, to Korea, and we met with uh, different leading thinkers, uh, industry leaders, uh, politicians, uh, people in the government. And what we realized was that a lot of the challenges had to do with a lack of good leadership. Now, this goes back to my story. When I was 10, I uh, went to a country called the Philippines because my parents were humanitarian workers. So when I was 10, I basically spent about 10 years in the Philippines. And what I noticed there at the time was how come a a country that used to be once a Korea's role model, okay, back in the days when Korea was really, really poor, the Philippines was a country that Korea used to look up to. But then when I went, when I was 10, uh, this is more towards 1990, I realized uh, something completely different. You know, how come a country that, you know, uh, many of, the other Asian countries used to look up to, how come the country is now where they are? You know, uh, they have the, second, uh, the world's second largest slum. They're having a lot of uh, political and social economic issues. 
And I began to wonder, especially given the fact that my parents were doing a lot of work uh, to, for, for the underprivileged, I was asking a question, what caused this to happen? And, uh, you know, again, I was very young at the time, but the way I could really think about was that this is what a bad leader can do as opposed to what a good leader can do. Because along, especially in my 20s, I was able to witness with my own eyes uh, why certain countries, including the Philippines, why countries, organizations and communities do well. Uh, they may not have done well in the past, but they're now doing well. As opposed to why do certain organizations or countries not do uh, well anymore, right? Or continue to remain in, you know, so-called the second tiers or the third tiers or what we call the state of medi- mediocrity, right? So I've been beginning to really see what really caused this to happen. And uh, the conclusion that I was able to come up it's, it's really about leadership, how uh, people, right, as key stakeholders take up uh, the challenge. Everyone is going, always going to be faced with the challenge. Uh, but how do we take up? I mean, the communities that they take up, they work on it and they face it and they try to uh, turn this around. Uh, we really see that there are uh, community, their country, their organizations will do well, as opposed to the ones that don't will suffer. That's what I noticed. Um, if I can really add to it, I mean, I've really had an uh, incredible time to explore uh, five different career fields, uh, especially in my 20s, uh, beginning my career in the United Nations and also the politics in Korea and also running my own uh, social profit or social enterprise in Korea and also serving the army uh, in Korea as well. And before heading over to uh, Harvard, you know, working for the financial a consulting company, during when I was able to witness the 2008 financial crisis, I was able to come up with five key patterns. You know, again, why do certain countries, organizations not do well as opposed to the ones that don't, uh, do well? Uh, one thing I realized was that, you know, the ones who actually uh, know how to deal failures or breakdowns, using failure and a breakdown as a way to do better next time. I was able to see that they were the ones who are able to go on the right path, as opposed to those who actually dealt failures as a shame or as a guilt were having some issues. I was also able to witness that the ones who had uh, a trouble with ignorance and arrogance, uh, this is always the issue that comes up all the time. Uh, people think that they know it all, but in fact, they don't. Uh, in fact, because they are arrogant, dealing with all the certain uncertainties around, uh, were the ones that we, uh, they weren't able to do well as opposed to the ones who were able to manage ignorance and arrogance as well. Another one was the learning that came along. Uh, the communities that really disciplined themselves uh, to learn new things, I found that they were doing well. Um, I also uh, was able to uh, see that some communities that do not avoid the work of leadership. You know, Again, all communities have different challenges, but if they don't embrace it or face it, are the ones who are going to always have the problem. We call this work avoidance. And yes, the last one is basically the ones who are always clinging onto power and authority. Uh, then leadership, right, were the communities that we were able to see as having a trouble. So 10s, uh, 20s, and especially, you know, at the turn of the 30s, when I felt that, you know what, what is one thing that I can give back to the community? That was when I really wanted to take a time to reflect. And I pursued a, a further a degree advanced program at Harvard, and I spent five years there. And this is how the Center for Asia Leadership comes about. Uh, there's really a lot of thought that I put into because I've never really had an experience of running something like this. But uh, again, you know, I'm still learning how to do it. I'm still making a lot of mistakes, but it's really a joy that I am able to take up what is really needed uh, in Asia. Oh, wow. It's interesting that how Kelly came about as an accumulation of all your life experiences and from your sense of curiosity as to trying to figure out why certain countries prosper and why certain countries don't as and you kind of align that with you know why certain organizations prosper and why certain organizations don't and you say that it's because it's leadership that makes an organization or country thrive or not thrive at all but when we ask anyone how to define the term leadership everyone will give a different answer. They will say maybe things like someone with a strong vision or someone with clear direction or someone who is very effective. The definitions can vary depending on who you uh, speak to. But for you personally, how would you define leadership? 
I think it's really uh, making a progress of change on a collective uh, challenge. I feel that, I mean, they, of course, they, you know, just like what you said, there are many different ways of defining leadership. Uh, but one of the definition I have is the ones who are able to pay attention to the problems, uh, the collective problems. Collective problems basically means that it's everyone's problem. And today we see that problem is not just you know affecting you. I mean, it's affecting basically all, uh, everyone. Now, it's really a matter of whether you are able to pay attention uh, besides whatever the work uh, that you do, you know, you have your own job scope and you have your own things that you should be accountable for to your boss for making a living. But at the same time, going a little bit further down and, you know, taking up that responsibility to really look into uh, what we call the collective challenge. Or in other words, we can call this things that are decaying in our society. So there are a lot of things that we, you know, in fact, that's happening. And and so do we have the courage to look after, pay attention and and, and really want to take up to resolve uh, these issues that we see. Otherwise, if we just leave it as it is, just like how I have mentioned it to you, um, you know, we have the arrogance, the ignorance issues. You know, we have a lot of uh, these issues that we see around that I was able to find out, you know, uh, how do we do deal with a lot of these failures, the system breakdowns, the lack of learning, right? And, you know, overuse or misuse of power and authority. When I was at the UN, I mean, I, Basically, I was uh, looking after all, about 40 over a conflict uh, in the world at the time. I, I was at the Security Council. And what I noticed was that these were basically all uh, man-made uh, problems, uh, human-made problems. And why can't we work together to make our world a better place? I mean, in fact, the reality isn't. You know, there is always, we are loyal to our uh, factions, our boundaries, our, our symbols. And we tend to always dominate or, you know, try to take over and try to cause, uh, you know, conflicts. And that's basically, if you look at the history, it's really that. I mean, the stronger ones basically taking over the, uh, the weaker ones. And it's really about human struggle, right? And so I was, as I see this, you know, why are humans not being able to live in peace and try to work towards more to creating a, a better peace, a better future for our world? And again, I, you know, when I was there back in, you know, 15 years ago, we were dealing with over 40 over problems. Today, I was surprised to know that we we're dealing with over 120 problems in this world. And so looking at this, I really see that there are a lot of things that are decaying in this world. And so leadership is really about paying attention to these problems and really wanting to reverse. I think there are many ways that we can reverse this course. And so it requires a commitment. It requires our, an action. And, uh, you know, we really need to focus on, on, the, on these problems. Again, if we just leave it as it is, this is going to be coming with a bigger uh, problem. It might uh, have other trickle down or spillover effect, giving us some more headaches. Because this is a collective challenge that impacts everyone, I should be mobilizing other people. Together and, with, and together with other people, we should be paying attention to the problems that are, are decaying in this world. And, and again, this is not just a, a national problem. It can be workplace challenge. It can be a, uh, a problem that's taking place in our family. Uh, maybe it can be your personal challenge. Uh, so we always have to pay attention to these challenges and these problems that we see. And we shouldn't be afraid of uh, embracing it, encountering it, and, and facing it, and then working on it. Yeah, I think that's a really good definition of leadership because leadership is most effective when the leader themselves, they see a problem and take the initiative and being proactive to try to solve that problem, be it a local issue, a company issue, or a regional or a country issue, and mobilize people around to work towards a, a better future or a solution. You have tremendous experience of observing and leading in across various culture based on your career in, in Korea, in the Philippines, and in the States. So based on your research, your observation, and your experience, what do you see are the major similarities and differences between leadership in Asia and leadership in the Western world? How are they different and how are they similar? The way that I see is that I, I think, yes, there are clear differences, but the way that I want to take it is that there are a lot of things that complement, that, that we can learn from each other. I think when it comes to uh, leadership in Asia, I think there is a that sense of community. We are 
you know, wanting to always look after who's around us, the family, the filial piety. Um, I think these are wonderful things for those people who have spent many years in a certain areas. I mean, we want to uh, pay respect to them and, and we want to give credit for what they have done. That's a wonderful thing. So I, I, I want to call that more of a discipline. Uh, we have the discipline. And, and one thing I, I define, you know, leadership as, as one of the key component is that for me, leadership begins with learning. Okay. And I, I think Asians are really I love to learn, right? They, they are really hungry for learning. And I, I think that's a wonderful thing. Uh, learning uh, new trends, new knowledge, new uh, skills. You know, I think this is a wonderful thing. Uh, one thing I was able to notice uh, when I went to observe the uh, Samsung Electronics, they're given a one hour lunch time and they basically spend about 10 to 15 minutes on their lunch. And then, and then the rest, they were basically going to learn new things. You know, they went to learn for coding, new language. And in fact, they offered a lot of learning uh, programs. And so I think overall, as I see it, Asians are really hungry for learning. And I call this discipline. It's a wonderful thing to have. For the West, I think that the word dignity, okay, meaning that it doesn't really matter what other people care or, or think about myself, but whatever I do, I, I earn for it, right? So you're the one, you know, depending on how much effort that you have given, that sense of dignity is, is there. You know, I earn for this, okay? And it doesn't really matter, you know, how other people think about it, but this is what I have earned for. And therefore, I am really proud for what I've done. As opposed to maybe in Asia, it's more of a face culture, right? What other people think of me is, is really, you know, something that kind of can get in the way and they have that social pressure and whatnot. But I think these are the two different things that, you know, we, 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 can, we can look into. But if I were to basically sum this up, I think the learning, um, again, from Asia, uh, the passion to learn is there. It's something that we can, we can uh, learn about. I think the mindset is important. Um, and I think... The heart, again, the, the mindset for wanting to look after other people, that sense of community, right? Collectivism uh, from Asia is a wonderful thing. And the discipline, right? The discipline, which is, you know, wanting to uh, discipline yourself. It's really about commitment, focus, attention. You know, how do you really discipline yourself into the work of leadership? I think that's another thing that I was able to draw. And, and stewards, you know, in order to do uh, a leadership work, we need a lot of great people. And so... I think just drawing, you know, lessons from here and there uh, or the patterns from here and there, these are the four things I'm able to identify. Learning, mindset, discipline, and stewards, uh, the people with which we, we do this leadership work. Yeah, if I were to kind of answer that question, I want to take it from that angle. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's really interesting because in my experience, I had the opportunity to work with leaders both in from Western organization as well as Eastern organizations. And it was a, interesting that you pointed out that Asian leaders, they are more collective. They care more about the people around them, whereas, you know, uh, Western leaders, they think about their sense of dignity more that, you know, I've put in the hard work. Uh, this is my achievement. This is the title that I've worked really hard for. This is the package that I worked really hard for. I, I deserve it. So there's that, you know, collective and individual kind of cultural value that plays out within leadership itself. And it's interesting that you've noticed this, the same thing too. But if we take a look only of leaders within Asia, actually the Asia continent is highly culturally diverse. So we have leaders like Jack Ma of Alibaba. We have uh, the president of the Philippines, like President Duterte, and even, you know, in Singapore, the late Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew, they all have very, very different characters. So based on maybe your observation and your experience, is there a way to describe Asian leadership or a way to categorize it? I think that's a very uh, a valid question. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Uh, and this goes back to uh, my uh, previous, you know, reply to the previous question. I think when it comes to Asia, you know, you, you see the growth uh, right now in Asia. Uh, it's among the six continents, it's the highest. Yet we see, uh, see that when it comes to geostrategic risk, uh, it's all also, uh, you know, highest among all the six continents. So I, I say that the Asia continent is really full of opportunities, but at the same time, uh, challenge. Now, the ones who are considered as really uh, great leaders, uh, they were really the ones who helped, you know, the communities to uh, see where the core challenge uh, was. In the previous question, I was I, I mentioned that it's really about paying attention to the collective challenge uh, that we face. 
I think some of the, is the, uh, these Asian leaders like uh, Alibaba, Jack Ma, and or we have Lee Kuan Yew, or we have Park Jong-hee from, the, from Korea, I think these leaders are highly regarded because they are the ones who have not have been the one to facilitate or, or to really steer their community to face uh, the challenge and try to gear their you know, focus and, and their energy to solving uh, these problems. Now, when you look to the West, you know, it's relatively stable, mature. They are living a very high standard of living. It's, it's wonderful. And their set of problem is in a way different. I mean, of course, they are faced with the migration and uh, all these, uh, you know, extremism and, and all these things. But, you know, when it comes to Asia right now, um, you know, we want to see many of the communities still living under $2 per day. We see, see, still see a lot of people uneducated. Uh, we're still wanting, uh, uh, you know, to provide jobs for people and things like that. But rather than telling people that, hey, I can, I know, you know, what the issue with this problem is and I have the solution to the problem. I think one of the, uh, you know, these people who we look up to are the ones who have helped people to see what the real problem is and perhaps what are the things that we can do together to take up. Okay. So what, what I'm trying to say is that yes, they helped to uh, help them to face the reality they were in, but also they went further to talk about, Hey, this is where we want to go. So called the aspiration, right? So they really show them where we are today to where we should be all be going. Perhaps this is the place that we all want to go called point B. And they really help to manage the process, make the process of change on a collective challenge to where they really want to go. Um, and so a lot of the stories around, again, these uh, uh, aforementioned uh, names of the leaders that we look up today are the ones who helped that to make it happen. And of course, this requires an incredible uh, collective effort. And, and they were the ones who really uh, steered and made this to happen. And uh, as opposed to the ones that we don't consider, and again, Asia, when it comes to Asia, a top-down, hierarchical, uh, we still have that element, that Asian element, right? The ones who have been using power and authority, we see that, you know, as we are living in this world where uncertainty is looming, right? Uh, we call this our, our world a VUCA, a volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. You know, we have a lot of uncertainties. And so it's in a way very difficult for just one person uh, to provide the solution to the problems that we see have not, in fact, been a, a good leader uh, that we consider, uh, that, we, that we want to respect. And so I think Asia, yes, uh, we have a lot of great leaders. But one thing, I, the pattern I see is that the ones who are able to really uh, facilitate helping people to pay attention to the problems and also talking about where they want to go, the aspiration, and really managing and making, helping to make a progress to go from one point to the other, as opposed to Asian leaders who always stick to power and authority because I have the title, I know this knowledge, and I have this experience, you know, trust me, believe me, I have all the solution. You know, there's a stark contrast. And we begin to realize that, yes, Asia, we really want to see a lot of these individuals taking up these a new style of leadership that we really require. Because again, Asia is full of opportunities, but also with challenges. So the key issue is how do we turn these downsides to upsides? How do we turn these challenges to opportunities? That's really where the leadership work uh, you know, it requires. And that's in fact what we can consider as the Asian leadership. And so that's sort of my uh, answer to, to your question on that. I think it's really interesting you brought up brought out the topic about authority and power because when I speak to people uh, about Asian leadership quite often they speak about people who already have a title people who, who inherited a position because they're they have a family background who is affluent who is from who has a lot of money or who has a lot of networking influence and automatically people will think that these are leaders so if I hear correctly, what you're saying is that people in power and authority are not exactly leaders. Is, is this something that you can explain a bit further? Yeah, I think it requires both, right? Um, I like to use the word accountability and responsibility, right? Accountability is really about title, right? Depending on what sort of a title that you hold in your workplace, for example, right? It's a more of a give and take, right? I mean, you have your to do things, right? Um, your boss is going to be holding you accountable for whatever that you're supposed to deliver. In return, 
you get to keep your job, you get the salary, right? That's sort of the accountability, you know, what says on job description. And depending on what your title is, you know, it's, it's really that. But further, um, I think really leadership is about not only doing your job well, your accountability, but also responsibility, right? So yes, you can use your title, okay? You can use that in a very good way to get your leadership work done. But you cannot just rely on your title all the time, right? Because I am the CEO, I am the president, I am the chairman of things. And that naturally comes with a, you know, I don't think it comes naturally a, you know, with the knowledge or the experiences. Yes, there's a reason why you're there. But still, again, the world that we see, a lot of you know, growing uncertainties. So what you can perhaps do using your title is not to use, you know, in a top-down way to execute the work but more taking up the role as a facilitator, right? You can use your title to help people to do their job. So it's more of a facilitating you know, work that you can do. So what I'm saying is that, yes, the title is required, um, but we need to make a use, a good use of this to do the leadership work. Overuse or misuse of the position in the title, in many ways, I was able to see that it uh, really hampers the process of making a progress, then helping to make a progress. So I think the job, uh, the title is important, um, but we have to be using uh, whatever the, the power that's been given to us, the title that we earned it, but we want to make a very good use of both the power, authority, and leadership. So because by the day, we really want to be someone who helps to make a progress, not to hamper or to harm. Based on what you observe, and I know you run uh, leadership programs all over Asia, and coming back to the previous answer that you've provided about, you know, what is Asian leadership? Do you see a change in trends of people adopting more of the new uh, leadership style of facilitation, of getting people collectively to do the work rather than being commanding and giving instructions? Or do you see that there are many ra- major roadblocks for people to adopt this uh, better way of leadership in Asia? Yeah, I, I think it comes in two different ways because the world is changing. And, you know, I often go to Korea and to the U.S. to really understand what, you know, things like artificial intelligence, and how that, that is going to be disrupting our job market, for example, the way, the way they, we, we conduct uh, business. How is this going to impact the way that we live? And so I've been really taking a very close look into what this will entail. And so for us, if we want to survive, yes, we have to be adaptable, right? We have to be changing ourselves. We have to adopt new way of doing things. And in the context of leadership, that's going to be a new style of leadership, right? I see that. But, you know, for those people, uh, they are very uh, proactive in embracing, you know, this new way of exercising leadership. Uh, as opposed to people who, you know, in a way, in order to survive, uh, are forced uh, to change the way that they exercise leadership style. So for me, I see that in Asia. And as Asia, again, you know, it's experienced the highest economic growth rate. You know, I was really surprised to know that while two jobs are being created in the West, today we see about 10 jobs being created in Asia. And so there's a really a lot of uh, new opportunities here. Uh, but again, it goes down to if we really, I mean, as, as an individual, one of the reasons why I left my work and, and have decided to take a time to reflect, and, and this was at Harvard for five years and have and I ended up creating uh, what I'm running now, the Center for Asia Leadership. I think one thing that we need to be mindful of is that let's look at, you know, uh, 10 years to 30 years down the road, looking back, how are you going to be measuring your success? Uh, that's really one of the key questions that I think everyone needs to ask. You know, of course, we all want to be someone who is adding value to the progress that our society is longing for, right? And I think uh, we need to ask the question of, are we trying to help to make the progress or are we the ones who are trying to hamper or harm? So if we really want to be a helping person to helping to pay attention to the the problems that are decaying in uh, in our society and the world and taking up and embracing that challenge of my own and wanting to turn that into and upside, right? I think we really have to know how we can be of help. And in, in doing that, we have to really adopt a new way of exercising a leadership. And so that's how I see it. And this is something that we have to pre- proactively take up. 
And at, at the center, that's what our all our you know, programs are all about, helping people to see something that we haven't known. I mean, per, perhaps because we uh, didn't know about it, or maybe they are they were ignorant to know about it. But we really need to see what are some of these areas that require our leadership intervention, leadership work. And so we really need to help them to see that and also give them the idea that, hey, you're the right person to do this. So I want to use also the word provoke and evoke. The type of leadership work that is required in Asia, I think as an individual, what we can do is to provoke the people around us, right? Hey, there's a very important work to be out there, right? The world is changing, right? That there's a, a technological disruptions. Uh, there are other sort of challenges that we see. You know, the world that we're living in is something that we have never lived in the past, right? So, you know, let's try to wake up. There are a lot of work to be done in our world, right? So it's really, you know, provoking them, uh, waking them up, but at the same time, evoking them, really breathing life into these people, telling them that, hey, yes, you know, we, there's a reason why we are here. And perhaps you may be the right person to really help to make a progress, to help to make a progress. And let's do this together. It's really, you know, giving inspiration, encouraging, you know, other people to do this work of leadership. Again, I like to use the word collectivism. You know, it's a really working on the collective challenge together collectively. And this is perhaps the role that we should play. So if I were to explain that, the new trends of leadership in Asia, I think, you know, we should really take up uh, provoking other people, but at the same time, evoking other people so that we have a lot of these people, you know, doing the work to address the things that are decaying and making our world a better place, you know, Asia a better place to be. Oh, wow. I totally agree when you say that, you know, the world is moving really, really fast. It's a VUCA world that we are living in. And the trend is towards new leadership because, you know, for any organization to thrive, you have to adapt. You, the old ways, no matter how strongly you hold on to it, it's going to eventually suffocate the organization and even your own career development and so on. It's also fantastic to hear that there are so many opportunities that are starting to boom in Asia itself. Like you were mentioning about two jobs being created in the States as compared to 10 jobs in Asia. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure with all these opportunities, there are plenty of individuals out there who want to be leaders themselves. So if uh, someone wants to be a leader in an Asian environment, and an Asian environment, of course, is uh, very unique to a Western environment in a sense, like you've mentioned a few times that we're definitely more collective, our uh, issues, our challenges in Asia are very different from the Western world. What do you think is the most important skill this person needs to have in order to be a successful leader? So let's say I am a junior person in an organization. I see a leadership position that I'm interested in. What are the skills that I need in order to get that leadership position? I think uh, there are many different uh, skills that we, we may require. But uh, one of the things I I, I really see it. Uh, I, I call this uh, attributes, uh, also at, this, at the same time skills. I think in Asia, one thing they really need, to, we really need to work on is the communication skills. The fact that we are able to really think through, you know, what is our theory of change, for example, right? This is the world that I see. Again, this is the problem that I see, but this is also at the same time how I envision this problem once we make an intervention to be, right? It's both the reality that we face, but also the aspiration, the point that we want to get to. I think you really need to know how to communicate this well, right? You know, we really need to drive or steer the uh, discussion, right? The conversation around, hey, so what, what we see with this problem, that we see, what sort of a pattern do we see, right? What can we notice? And trying to really see really the core areas that we can make an intervention, Right. Rather than just saying, hey, you know, the problem that we see is that, you know, there are so many poor people out there. Let's try to really see what the patterns are. Why is this causing? It, right. Is it because of the education? The parents not wanting to send their kids to school because they want their children to go in and basically sell goods to make a living. There has to be really well, what are the patterns that we see, you know, in understanding the reality? And we really need someone who knows how to drive this conversation. You know, ones who know how to articulate and defining what the problem is. But at the same time, you also have to talk about where you, we, we want to be in five years or 10 years time, right? So talking about the aspiration, you really need to articulate that well and really give them, give people your, or your stakeholders around a sense of hope. Yes, that this is a goal that we can manage to achieve. It's not so much a, a dream land or this is too fluffy to get. 
it's really something that we are able to reach, right? So that communication part is extremely, extremely important. And I know that in Asia, we don't really encourage a lot of people to, to share their ideas, right? Especially in Korea and Japan, right? You know, we don't want to be a sticking nail. You know, we want to be silent. We want to know what other people in the position of authority want to know. But this is one of the things that we have to change, right? We really have to invite different perspective. What do you think? I mean, I've been working on this for now four years and, and we've been traveling to now. I mean, we've been running this program in over about 78 cities in 32 countries. And one of the reasons why we are able to get there is because I really took up, you know, really listened to other people. What are their challenges? And what are some of the areas that we can really look into to work on? And that has really invited people in the understanding that we share a similar passion, you know, passion to do good to help advance the public interest. You know, we were able, I was able to make a lot of good friends who really were like-minded. And that communication has really made me to get to where we are in just in four years. And I'm really surprised by by how far we have reached. So I think communication Mm -hmm. is really, really important. And I mean, for all the other things, I mean, I think um, very important, you know, practical reasoning, critical thinking, you know, uh, creativity, um, you know, managing group dynamics and all that. But I think if I were to add one more, I think it's really the relationship building and management, you know, which I call the stewardship, right? It's really, really important. The problem that we face, it's a collective issue and it's really, really difficult for just one person to come up with an idea, you know, the solution or the idea to as to how we want to solve that problem. So we really need to have very good people around us. So we have to know how to build relationship and manage relationship. And we not only need to have uh, you know peers who are able to help you provoke and evoke, but you also need some you know people with a great experience who are able to help you open the doors for you to take up a new challenge, right, or new opportunities. You know, when you're stuck, you need some people who are able to open the doors for you so that you may be able to do more work, more important work of leadership. So we need both the people who are able to advise, but also a- people who are able to enable us to do the work. So. I think managing, building relationship is really also a very important skill that we require. And of course, besides the ones that I've mentioned about provoking and invoking, I think that's in a way that could possibly fall under communication. But provoking and invoking is a wonderful, wonderful thing. You know, you should really know how to provoke, wake people up and try to have them pay attention to the things that are decaying in this world. But at the same time, giving them the hope that, yes, together we are able to do this. Together, we are able to solve our, you know, work on this problem and in the end make this to uh, you know, create a better place. If I were to just kind of uh, mention that, I think it's communication and it's really the relationship building and management. Oh, wow. I think it's really amazing that in the last four years with Kelly, you have helped build leaders in so many, so many different countries and to be able to see leaders uh, improve and, and progress and probably help Hopefully they have helped their own community, their own teams, their own organization become better than they were. So that is like an amazing achievement. It's so wonderful to hear. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I'm, 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 re- I'm also very grateful that we were, I, I was able to really have uh, very good people around me to make this to work. And so therefore, I really cherish building, meeting new people, you know, building relationships with them and, and continuing on uh, keeping that relationship. Oh, yeah, definitely. Especially since in the Asian environment, we are based on a collective kind of principle. So people really matter in almost anything that we do, whether we want to improve a process, whether we want to lead people, whether we want to make decisions, people are involved. So it's quite interesting and spot on that you've mentioned that communication is an important skill as well as relationship managing and building. Yeah. I mean, if I were just to add one thing in in regards to building relationship and managing it, I think if you are in the uh, person who are in the position of authority, I think your accountability is making sure that, of course, whichever organization that you belong to, uh, making sure that that, you know, uh, is, is sustainably running well and, and making profits and, and doing what it's supposed to do. But at the same time, uh, I think the responsibility is really uh, looking for, you know, who are these young up and coming years that requires my support and my attention to help them achieve uh, their aspiration, right? Yeah. So I think it, it comes in two ways. And I'm a, a, a huge beneficiary of that because, again, uh, my parents being the humanitarian worker, I mean, my parents are not in a way 
rich, you know, famous or powerful. Um, but it was really the people who helped me, right? Who helped me, who were able to sit down and pay attention to what my passion uh, for this world was. Uh, in fact, I do still maintain a very close uh, relationship with them. They're the ones who helped to have me where, where I am today. And so I am also feel, you know, I feel indebted to do the, to likewise for other people. So I, I, what I'm trying to say is that I think this has to be coming in two different ways. You taking up the effort to really, you know, build uh, people who are able to advise, but also who are able to enable, right? But also, if you are in the position to help other people, you also need to take up that responsibility of looking for, looking after these young up and coming leaders who uh, we will need in, in Asia, again, in our all collective effort to make uh, this continent a wonderful place to be. Yeah, I think you've brought up a really good point too, that it's not only just our personal effort in acquiring the right skills to be a leader, but making sure that we have the right people around us to help foster and grow, give us feedback, make us to become better leaders too. But let me ask you, how about companies and organizations who want to grow uh, pipelines of leadership? What can they do to help foster and develop leaders within their organization? Uh, I just came back from Boston two weeks ago and I, w- I came across with the article that there are uh, four things that the you know, so-called the companies are looking at. And one of them is called the rationality quotient. I think uh, that's a, a sort of the gift from our maker, uh, the ability to think, okay? It's a wonderful gift that we have. And, you know, that basically means that, you know, when we look at certain issues or certain events or certain things that, that, that is happening in our world, you know, we have to really think about it. You know, what have caused this to happen, for example? Okay, again, you know, when I was 10, when I went to the Philippines, that was basically one of the questions. Well, how come a, once a country that used to be a role model country is now where we're there today with a lot of, you know, about 4 million uh, you know, people living in the slums, you know? I mean, what happened? What caused this to happen? And the ability to come up with some very good questions and really think through and developing your own sort of theory of change, right? So this is what we are. But if we are able to do this, this is how we can go, right? I think rationality quotient is a wonderful thing and, and something that uh, companies need to help them uh, steer. And in fact, we, we no longer live uh, in times of what we call the knowledge-based economy or society, where today knowledge is readily available everywhere. And in one of the articles that I read, knowledge is being doubled up every 10 to 12 hours. So knowledge is readily available everywhere. As opposed to we are now living in what we call the conceptual uh, society, conceptual-based economy, where we see a lot of different knowledge, different uh, you know ideas, but how do we put them together to create something new? So it's again, how do you identify a pattern here? That's one thing that you know through your thinking, you're able to help your company identify new opportunities. One thing I'd like to also add in one of the business, Harvard Business School class I've taken, what, what he said was that, you know, all the competition or most of the competition between the big companies, small companies are all revolving around that 40 percent, uh, what we call the competitive zone. There are still about 60 other 60 percent that still is untapped. If we are able to think through, we are able to find a pattern, we are able to take up a new perspective. These are the new area of opportunities. Yet still haven't been been tapped yet, right? So through that rationality quotient, and if the company is able to do that, then you're really encouraging young people to, you know, identify new opportunities, uh, maybe a new income stream for for the companies. I think another one is called the adversity quotient, which is basically dealing with failures. As again, we're living in a highly uncertain world. We are going to make certain trials and errors and uh, failures, rather than giving them the idea, you know, for those people who have made a mistake, a uh, feeling of guilt and shame, you, you can really use that because I think failure is a wonderful indicator as to where you are. You know, what are the things that you're doing well? What are the things that you shouldn't be doing uh, again next time? And, you know, what are the things that you have to improve? It's a perfect indicator for you to know, you know, what you can do better next time, right? So it's adversity quotient and giving them the idea that, yes, failure, vulnerability, and dealing with uncertainty. Is in fact, you know, it's something that we we have to take up, right? It's it's you know, we have to be comfortable with it. I think uh, another one is you know helping again people to learn, right? I, I think the more the people learn, I think you know leadership begins with uh, learning, education. Uh, the greater 
knowledge they have about uh, the, the new trends, right? How this is going to impact our world, new skills, the industry skills, new knowledge. I think, you know, and, and encouraging people to, to do that, I think uh, they will have a lot of things to add value to your company. And lastly, one thing I, I told you was, was basically, basically about the people skill, right? Uh, the stewardship, teaching them how to build relationship, how to maintain or how to manage relationship. That's a wonderful thing, right? Because I think this is one skill that's you know, needed in Asia where, you know, especially in Korea, all the children are locked up in a room, right? From kindergarten to the time they graduate from high school, they have to really get the best scores. You know, they have to know how to memorize. Everything's really really around you, right? It's not really around working with other people, right? So when they come to a workspace or workplace where you know, a lot of that collaboration is required, a lot of that discussion, a lot of that brainstorming, a lot of that you know, collective effort is being required, people struggle, right? So we really need to help. And I think uh, the, the companies needs to, uh, in a way, encourage, but at the same time, reinforce uh, these people management, people building skills. So if I were to mention these four things, I, I think that's how we are able to groom uh, leaders within. Oh, wow. It sounds like Asia has this, this uh, huge opportunity to grow even more leaders than we have today. And hopefully we could see a much better Asia with lower levels of poverty all around and more higher education, higher, higher literacy in the next five to 10 years or so. So if you have any parting advice for our listeners who aspire to be a leader in Asia, what would that parting advice be? Yeah, I mean, I want to reiterate again that we don't have to look far to see what are some of these leadership that work that we can do. You can begin with working on your personal issue. I mean, if you are really wanting to become someone who's influential, who wants to bring a lot of great impact for our world, you, know, you have to really begin from yourself first, right? Again, I use the word learning mindset, discipline, and steward. That's possibly the best area that you can start off with. If you are quiet, not so much disciplined with, you know, wanting to learn, read books. I mean, one thing I encourage young people to do is that, you know, try to take up that goal of reading about 50 books per year. At least try to spend about 30 minutes, one hour before you go to bed reading, right? So try to have, take up that habit of wanting to learn new things. Um, new knowledge, new trends, new skill sets. You know, we should be very much eager to do this. And the next one is really the mindset. You know, what are some of the, the things I can contribute? Kind of, how can I be a contributing factor to make this world a better place? And identifying one issue, right? Again, accountability, you can do your job well, you can do really well on your test and you're, you know, maintaining your good grades. But asking this question, how much of my time am I giving of my time for the cause of other people? the things that are possibly being in this world, right? In our community, you know, how much of the time am I giving away for that work of leadership? I think that mindset, not only thinking about me, but also the concept of we is important. And also having that discipline again, again, you know, discipline, you know, if I were committed to working on this problem, yes, there's going to be a lot of distraction, but how do I stay focused on this work of leadership? How do I weather this distraction that's coming in the way, on the way, right? So you have to really think about it, disciplining yourself. And lastly, really taking up that work of, you know, finding some good people around us. You know, these enablers, the people who are able to advise, people who are able to provoke you and invoke you, right? I think those are really, really important. And so I hope that whoever's listening to this, that uh, they are able to take up this uh, new habit a uh, new uh, commitment. And I can guarantee you that, you know, you do this, you're committed to doing this. I hope to uh, hear from any of the uh, listeners to come and tell me that after three years, uh, three months or six months, or, you know, if not after a year, that something meaningful has changed in their lives personally, but also uh, they have taken up to address some of these uh, social issues. Again, the problems that are decaying in this world, uh, these collective challenges that we see. So, this is really the sort of message, my message to you. And I hope that if we have a lot of these people in Asia, I think, yes, there's a hope for Asia, you know, and I, I see that. And uh, we really need a lot of people who are able uh, to make this to happen. So that's really my last word uh, before we close. 
Thank you so much, Sam, for your time and your generosity in sharing your experiences and wisdom. I also have the same hope that our listeners will be able to be to gain some insight or some inspiration to go out and do something, solve a problem, tackle an issue, have a aspiration and share it with others as well. If any of our listeners would like to get in touch with you, how can they do so? Uh, Lingmi, first of all, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to really share my thoughts and um, what I really care about. So really thank you for that. Uh, for those people who really want to know uh, about the work that we do, I think they can come to our website, the asialeadership.org. Uh, we are on the Facebook, we are on Instagram, we are on a LinkedIn. So you may be able to see what we do. And I hope that for some, uh, we also invite people to come and work with us, either as a uh, teaching assistants or as interns or as writers, or, you know, we have that all different range of, uh, ranges of opportunities short-term, long-term, uh, full-time, you know, part-time. Uh, we hope to really see uh, more people taking up this uh, wonderful uh, work that has to be done in Asia. And I hope that by following us, uh, you know, the asialeadership.org, we hope to stay close in touch with you and hope that you'll be, again, the enablers, the ones who are able to advise as to what more important work that we can do. Again, we are very much open to listening, wanting to learn from other people. And again, as someone who doesn't come with a, an expertise in this area, again, I'm, I'm always in, in the mode of learning because it's quite new to me. I really invite other people's intervention and support in this work. So I do look forward to meeting uh, some of the li uh, listeners in the future. Thank you again, Samuel, for your time. Thank you so much, Lingmi. Thank you. That was Samuel Kim, president and co-founder of the Center for Asia Leadership. We were just discussing about leadership in Asia. Highlights from this episode and contact details of our guest is available on our website at www.culturespark.co slash podcasts. That is www.culturespark.co slash podcast, P-O-D-C-A-S-T-S. In our next episode, we will speak to Gabrielle Frida Lowe, who is the account director of Jubatical based in Singapore. We will be discussing about the future of work. If you enjoy listening to this podcast, take a moment to rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Music, or wherever you download your podcast. If you believe this podcast show will help a friend or family, please share this episode with them via social media or your podcast app. Thank you for listening to the Leaders of Learning podcast. <laughs>